Hello and welcome to the Scottish Clans. I'm Clint. Thanks for joining me today, this morning, tonight, whenever it is that you're listening to this. Uh, in another time dimension, I don't know. Some some of you may have figured something out that I don't know about. Anyway, thank you for joining me. Today we are going to be discussing a clan founder, Ferker McIntaggart. And before I start talking too much about him, I am going to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, USA Kilts. They have awesome kilts. They have awesome everything, ton of other stuff, anything that you'd want to express your pride in your Scottish heritage. Yes, also Irish, Welsh, other things. They have a pretty broad spectrum of things that include, uh, but mostly things that somehow tie into that Celtic world of the of the British Isles. Anyway, go check that out. Very high quality material, um, very well put together things, great customer service, and free shipping in the U.S. Also check out their YouTube channel at USA Kilts and Celtic Traditions, which has a ton of cool stuff on there. A lot of cool content, a lot of stuff that's helpful about wearing kilts, about Scottish culture, about some, they got some history stuff on there, so go check them out. Anyway, so let's talk about this gentleman that is the founder of Clan Ross and also other adherents to that clan, like the McTaggarts, <clears throat> which I knew a wonderful family in previous area that I lived in back in Idaho. They're the Taggarts. Of course, once, once upon a time, that was probably McTaggart. But anyway, uh, yeah, so my con- my only, my, my most, my firsthand knowledge of this line of people is good, very positive. So I don't think they'll ever listen to this because they'd never... Uh, demonstrated any kind of interest in this subject, but if in case they ever do, I hope they know that I'm talking well of them. Anyway, so here's the deal. Mo- let me start by talking about my sources. My sources to start off with, I've got two books that I've been taking most of my information from. They are both by the same author, R. Andrew McDonald. And you can look him up. He's a He's a well-attested scholar. He's written a lot of material, and he is cited in a lot of other scholars' works. So the first book that I'll mention is The Kingdom of the Isles, Scotland's Western Seaboard, circa 1100 to circa 1336. And the other book is called Outlaws of Medieval Scotland, Challenges to the Canmore Kings, 1058 to 1266. So both awesome reads. If you are interested in this, you can really dig deep and learn about a whole world and you can the cool thing about this is you can you can tie some things together you can con- connect some dots and then this picture this better more clear picture starts to form in your head so i really recommend you dig into those and if you just if you're not quite there to reading scholarly books yet and you just want to learn a little bit about a clan then this this is also a good a good thing for you to do is listen to this this episode of the Scottish Clans podcast all right so we're talking about Ferker McIntaggart who i will refer to from here on out as just Ferker And he is the founder of the Ross clan. And he was a very important person in Scottish history. But unless you're starting to dig into things, you don't hear about him very much because he's kind of out on the periphery, but he played a key role out there, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Another, uh, something that's very, I think that's really interesting about Ferker is that he descends from an older kindred called Obiolan. Now, there's some people that claim there's there's disagreements. Um, a lot of what people, back in the 1800s, there's a scholar named William Skeen, and he wrote some works that a lot of people go back and tie into for a scholarly foundation. Now, not all of today's scholars agree with him, but we have him on one side, we have a gentleman named, by the name of Grant on another side making arguments about who the Obiolans were. I think this is a really interesting topic. Uh, one is because we see this kindred that uses the O, which was originally in the Gallic Ua. And I did a whole episode on Mac versus O. And if you have studied at all about Scottish history and the different clans, you know that Mac is overwhelmingly numerically superior to the O. You don't see the O which signifies, so Mac is Gallic for son of, the O is, signifies grandson or descendant of. And this in Scotland, you had a different way, they had they, they had a kind of a different style that they liked to use rather than the Ua, or which became the O. And the, I can't remember what episode it was, but I called it Mac versus O. So it's really easy to find if you just search back through the list of episodes. But the 
in Scotland, they tended to go with Mac Vic. And the Vic is, is still Mac. It's just, it's in the genitive form, which gen, the genitive, all that does is show possess, possession. For those of you who've never done noun declensions, I had a couple of semesters of Latin in college and, and got to, I don't, it's a long time ago and I'm, my Latin isn't very good, but but it did really get provided a cool foundation for to learn about languages in the future. So Mac Vic, so the son of the son of, and then somebody that you're talking about. So if Biolan was to take this more common form in Scotland, it would instead of O Biolan, it would be Mac Vic o, Mac Vic Violan, or something like that. Um, but so we see this rare form of the O in Scotland or a rare instance of the O. So you have the, but it's, and it's also interesting because it's this clan that nobody really knows about today. That's really interesting to me that there are clans, very powerful clans that rose and fell. And some of them we know about and some of we don't really. So that I, I could go into that deeper, but that's really intriguing to me about this Ferker is that he was, MacIntaggart wasn't his surname. Obiolon was his surname. MacIntaggart means something along the lines of son of the priest. And like I said, there's argument about, does this tie back into Applecross Abbey on the western coast of Scotland? Or was the family more firmly established in the eastern part of Ross? There, so anyway, I'll let you, if you want to dig into that more, you can. But either way, the this Obiolon kindred had roots very deep in the, the area that we call Ross. And they became the earls of Ross, but that didn't happen just overnight. And it just didn't pop out of thin air. There's a story behind how they became the earls of Ross. Um, but before I, before I move on to those cool stories... Let me just also mention another interesting thing about this Obiolon surname. The Earls of Ross, so Ferker MacIntaggart, he becomes a knight, and I think it's actually his son that becomes the first Earl of Ross. But they, this line descended from Ferker, actually keep the Obiolon surname until the earldom passes out through marriage, through an heiress to the Leslies. And the Leslies for, I, I think it wasn't very long. It was very short that they were the Earls of Ross. And then we see the contest, the, con, the contest over the, this earldom, this, which is a vast area of land in Northern Scotland. And we see one of the stewards who thinks it's, he's in line for it. And you see the Lord of the Isles that he should be it. And this ends up in the Battle of Harlaw eventually, which, and, and I did a whole episode on that, so I'm not going to go into that. But yeah, the, Red Harlaw, as it's called. I did a whole episode on that if you want to go go back and look at that and the different clans that were tied into that and some of the cool stories that came out of that contest. But before all that, so you have this line of the Earls of Ross before it passes to Leslie's and they're using this Obiolon surname. And one reason that I think is interest, that this is also interesting is because, and this ties back into the series of episodes I did about when you have a, an earldom that's called something, and then you have a clan of the same name. And we did three examples of this. We did Crawford, Crawford, Ross, and Sutherland. And all three of them are different. So there's no stamp, there's no pattern that everything falls into here. In the case of the Sutherlands, the the descendants of Fresk and de Moravia, which I talked a lot about in that recent episode on the Flemish um people who settled up in the major clans that are descended from these Flemish knights that, that came into Scotland. So Freskin's descendants, and they have the earldom of Sutherland, but then it ends in an heiress, kind of like the earldom of Ross did, but it went a different direction. So you see that you have a, a younger son of the Earl of Huntley, a Gordon, who, if I understand this correctly, even the Gordons were originally Setons, and, and, but they, had, they took the name Gordon as they inherited the earldom of Huntley in Mary. Anyway, that's kind of an interesting there too. But when the Gordons inherited this younger branch of the Gordons, when they inherited the earldom of Sutherland, they also inherited the leadership of the kindred. It was contested for a generation or so, but eventually the Earl of Sutherland is also the chief of the Sutherlands, of the, the kindred that go by that name. They wouldn't adopt that last name clear up until the Jacobite rebellions to distance themselves from the house of Huntley because the, the Huntleys were Catholic. And I believe that they're sticking with the Jacobite cause, whereas the Earls of Sutherland were Protestant and they wanted to um, 
they what they supported the House of Hanover, and so they wanted to distance themselves from the Huntley House. So they actually finally adopt the surname of Sutherland, which kindred they'd been leading, and they'd been the Earls of Sutherland for generations and generations. So in that case, you have the person that inherits the, the, the earldom goes out of the family, at least in the male line we're talking about. And that heir that comes in and inherits that through the female line, he also becomes a head of the kindred. The Rosses, they, that didn't happen. So you have the, uh, I can't remember, it was the, the fourth down from Ferker. Uh, you guys can go back and check that. But he he has an heiress. And so the, this Leslie who had married this heiress, he inherits the Earl of Ross, but the kindred continues to be led by by a, like a different, uh, a younger brother or somebody that the next male person, this next male representative. So the Rosses keep the leadership of the kindred in house, unlike the Sutherlands. So that's, that's kind of interesting to me that it ended up differently. And then the, the Crawford was a different deal. It was, there was even less connection between the earldom and the kindred. You can go and check those out. So I just think that's an interesting reason why this whole thing ends up the way it does, that you have this Obiolon, their O's, rather than Mac or Macvic. They're, they're a rare instance of O. They're a, a, a very powerful older kindred that that uh, has been around for a while, and but we don't have the, we don't have, nobody knows the Obiolons. When you're studying Scottish clans, nobody talks about Obiolon. So that's... So that we have this emergence, but we, and we probably would never know about him had it not been for Ferker. <clears throat> and then another thing that's noteworthy about Ferker is that his daughter, Mary, his daughter, uh, in one source, I saw it Christiana and another one, I saw it Christina. Either way, she marries Olaf, King of the Man and the Isles, which indicates that Ferker was interested in this Norse Gallic world of the Hebrides and Western seaboard that stretches all the way down through Galloway. He was interested in this world, and he marries his daughter into one of the most powerful people in that world. Now, before I go on and talk about why Ferker was such a pivotal person in Scottish history, I just want to talk about my sponsor for a second, USA Kilts. Guys, I've got, I've got a kilt in the, like a five-yard wool kilt in the in the uh, McFarland hunting tartan. And I save that for like, I go, I'm going to go to a Scottish festival in a week out in Moab. And, and so that's going to be cool. If you're anywhere in that vicinity, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to try to get some more interviews like I did last time. Um, and, and post those and make episodes out of that. Um, so I'd wear the, the five yard wool kilt for something like that. But the, the, uh, Casual kilt, that's the one I take hike and I wear all the time and I love both of them. So if you have any desire to get a kilt or anything else to express your Scottish heritage or your Celtic heritage, go check them out at usakilts.com. That's their storefront. Awesome customer service, free shipping in the U.S. Go check them out. Also check out their YouTube channel at USA Kilts and Celtic Traditions. They've got tons of cool content on there. Uh, I I really, they've got, like when I say tons, I mean tons. I, I think it's fun to watch, but I just don't have time to watch YouTube that much and so you're you're probably not going to run out of things to watch if you're interested in learning about how to wear kilts and they've got some Scottish history and culture and stuff on there. It's all it's all fun. Go check them out. Rocky and Eric do an awesome job. Some of the rest of their crew they've got those are the ones I'm most familiar with. They've got a few other key players on there um, that that are also doing a great job. So sorry guys that I didn't I didn't have your names ready there. Um, Back into why Ferker was such a pivotal person in Scottish history. Guys, in 1215, there was a rebellion in the very north of Scotland. It was led by Donald Ban MacWilliam, who represented a, a branch of the royal family of Alaba. Now, keep in mind, at, at this earlier stage, 1215... Alaba, which is the Gallic for Scotland, did not look like what it looks like today. It was not as not it was not as big. It was more confined. And the whole province of Murray was contested. It was a good way to say it. And this goes this goes way back between the uh, the rivalry between the Canal Lorne and the Canal uh, Canal Navrine or Canal Gabran or however you want to say that. But <clears throat> those are the two alternating leading kindreds of Dalriada. And one pushes east and and intermarries with the Pictish royal house, and they beget the the MacAlpin line of the kings of Alaba. But the Canal Lorne pushes up the Great Glen and gets established in Murray. Probably did, yes. I, I would I would be surprised if they did intermarry with Pictish nobility up there. But you have these two competing houses, and the how the Alaba wants to bring Murray within their control, 
And at this point in time that we're talking about now, it was not firmly within their control. And you have uh, uh, this, this McWilliam branch of the royal family of Alaba. So in the south, they they have an they have a, an uprising against Alexander II. He's the one that's the king of Alaba at this time. And and it's not only Donald Bond McWilliam, but it's Ken, Kenneth McKeth, who I have mentioned before. I, I I believe this this McKeth people that we see. At this point in time, and by the way, it talks more about this in that book that I mentioned, Outlaws of Medieval Scotland. I believe these are the ancestors of the Mackays. And I, I also probably represent the royal family of Canel Lorne and the kings slash Mormares of Murray. And it went back and forth whether they referred to as kings or or Murray or uh, kings or Mormares or – and there's some work that's been done on that, some scholarly work. Maybe I can find that that I've read and, and post it. Anyway, um, so you have these two, Donald Bond and Kenneth McKeth, and they have this uprising in the north. And Ferker McIntyre, this is where we see him come on the scene in a big way. He puts down this uprising. So he's siding with the kings of Alba in putting this insurrection down. Now, there's two things that are significant about this. One is that you've got a guy that's out with, from without the area that's firmly Alaba, and you have, so he's he's outside of that, and he's the he's already a very powerful person. He's at the head of a powerful kindred who can compete with a branch of the royal house on fair on not only equal grounds but but actually come out on top in that contest. Very powerful people were represented by the McKeths who had been Earls of Ross before and and the a branch of the royal family. So this is no these are no slouches that he's coming out and putting down in this rebellion. This is very powerful people who probably could command a pretty good following. And he he comes it looks as far as the historical record is concerned, it looks like he's coming out of nowhere. But he had to have already been a big dude um influence speak like in an influential way that he can come out and he can compete with these people and smash the rebellion. And in return for doing so, he was rewarded with a knighthood for his services to King Alexander II. Um, So in doing so, you have a native lord and a native head of a kindred in this far north person on the the periphery of Alaba. So with this victory that he has in smashing this rebellion— it brings this part. So this, and you, you got to see this in connection also with those Flemish people like like Freskin, who becomes Freskin de Moravia or Freskin of Murray. These are, should all be seen as kind of part of a picture that's coming together to bring Murray firmly within the Scottish kingdom. Um, yeah, that's a that's a big deal. And there's another uh, revolt that he smashed in Galloway, which is in the opposite end of the country. So this is interesting. In 1234, Thomas of Galloway, he who's a descendant of Fergus, Lord of Galloway, and I think it's only I think Fergus was his grandpa. I didn't look that up, so go check that. But um, his dad, if Thomas's father, was Alan of Galloway, and he led an uprising against Alexander II. They jump in 1234, they jump up, start smashing things, burning things down. Thomas's forces were led by a man named Gilrua, or the Red Servant, as I think is how that translated. But so in 1235, that's when King Alexander responds militarily, brings his forces down in the area to suppress the revolt. But Gilrua ambushes the royal forces and would have completely wiped them out had not Ferker arrives from, from Ross with the men of Ross and completely changes the tide of battle, saves the king's army, smashes the revolt. Thomas and Gilarua have to flee to Ulster. And this, and, and if, you know, okay, hey, what's the big deal? Who's this Thomas of Galloway? Galloway, if you don't know, was like a semi-independent sub-kingdom of Alaba slash Scotland. And this, this Ferker coming down and, and turning the tide of that battle that really that was a decisive moment in making bringing Galloway firmly within the Scottish or the the kingdom of Alaba and and reaching the current extent of what Scotland is today so these two crucial military victories led by Ferker that they, they they were huge in helping Scotland become what it is today now here's another reason why Ferker is interesting to me and this is my my last point is that 
He lived during a period in Scotland's history where the Normans were becoming established in Scotland. Some people talk about this in terms of the Normans coming in and displacing the native leaders and introducing their feudalism in place of the kin-based society that already existed. And then the clans come out of the feudalism. And that's convoluted, but that's how I've seen it presented. And for sure, Norman incomers did replace some of the natives, but not all of them. And so in Ferker is an example, among many others, some out in the Hebrides, some out in, down in Galloway, we see these native nobility willingly integrating into this new European idea that all the cool kids are doing. Because these Normans that are coming in, they're the cool kids. The, the kings of Scotland, they're going bonkers for this for the Normans. They think the Normans are the coolest people ever. And there's a reason why that, if you studied the life of David I and his experiences, there's a good reason why he would love the Normans. And, but it didn't necessarily start with him. But you have the native ruling Scottish dynasty just becomes enamored with the Normans and their French culture and their feudalism. And they think it's the coolest thing. And so they welcome these people in, give them high positions. And now these Normans become the cool kids. Well, these they they didn't replace all the natives, and in many cases, our Andrew McDonald shows us very well that that the you have a lot of instances of native rulers who didn't who were not displaced, where feudalism didn't just wash out everything that was there before, but these people willingly bringing their local Gallic customs and cultures and traditions with them, and they willingly adopt these elements of feudalism. And one of the things they brought with them was this kin-based society. So rather than a replacement, we're going to scrap what was there before and we're going to start with feudalism and the clan spring out of that. That, that That's incorrect. Did feudalism influence the kin-based society? For sure. For sure it did. But it did not replace whatever was there before and start the clans. The clans have deeper roots in a kin-based society that goes as far back as we have records. Clear back into Dalriada. And, and you see as time goes on and the Normans come in and they bring feudalism, the native lords, Ferker is a good example of the native lords, seeing this, accepting this, reaching out, bringing it in, marrying it, mixing it with what existed before and producing the, what, the culture of Scotland that would come out of this, not just in the highlands, but all over Scotland, you would have this integration of a kin-based society and feudalism. Now, it didn't look the same everywhere in Scotland, and I'll grant you that. If you're one of these people like, you know, the, the Highlands are one thing and the Lowlands... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not here to say that the Highlands versus the Borders versus Aberdeenshire area and Galloway and that all look the same. I'm not saying that, but definitely we do have a lot of the similar ingredients going together, but maybe not in the same ratios everywhere. So anyway, so that's why I think Ferker is a cool example and a cool person to study and to know about. And that's why I wanted to do an episode on him, the founder of the Ross clan, who become a big deal in the history of Scotland, especially up there in the north. So in conclusion, Ferker lived in a pivotal time in Scottish history, played a key role in the development of the Scottish realm. He founded a line of earls and a major highland clan, the clan Ross, as well as other branches. Guys, I hope I hope you enjoyed that. I hope, I hope we had a fun time together. Um, let me just shut, throw a little... Shout out for my Origin of the Scottish Clans online course that's coming up. It'll be a two to three hour course, uh, like a kind of a mini lower division college course on the origin of the Scottish clans. Uh, I do have some cool products that might aid you in your study of Scottish history. Go to scottish-clans, uh, sorry, scottish Dash clans.com. Yes, scottish dash clans.com. I'll put relevant links below in the notes, but go there and you can I, you can get a a PDF version of the 1587 Roll of the Clans. You can get General Wade's report on the Highlands from 1724. These are contemporary documents, although, yes, they're seen kind of from an outsider point of view, but it is, I think, helpful to see how the clans were perceived at these different time periods. The one is you can find at scottish-clans.com forward slash 1587, and the other one you can go to scottish-clans.com forward slash Wade. And you can get copies of those. I think just having a PDF copy, yeah, you can find that online. Just Google it and you can find it pretty easy. But having a PDF copy, I think, uh, enhances our ability to study it. You can highlight, you can add notes, you can include, tie it into things that you've seen in other places, and you can build a better picture. I think they're useful. 
more useful than a web page that you can read. And then as soon as you navigate away from it, it's gone and doesn't have your notes on it and all that stuff. So yeah, go check those out. Go check our Facebook, our Facebook uh, group, Scottish Clans Out. There's lots of cool conversations over there. And also, if you want to reach out and request an episode, you can go to thescottishclans at gmail.com until I get another one up and running that's more connected with the website. So until next time, Marsh and Leib and Dorastek.